to the vehement report. Vehement, or V-H-E-M-T, stands for Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. It's a philosophy, an environmental ethic, and a worldview which encourages people to cease procreating until the human species naturally dies out for the sake of non-human species which would be much better off without us here. Today, I'll be responding to my recent interview on the LOF YouTube channel. I'm guessing most of you listening have already seen it, and that's how you came to my channel in the first place. I was a little delayed in getting this response recorded because I was waiting on a new mic to arrive. Hopefully, the improvement is apparent. First off, Andrew from LOF was very friendly and respectful during the whole process. The uncut interview was much longer, though, maybe about 30 to 40 minutes. So he cut a lot of it. It's a pretty decent intro to the topic of vehement, but but it barely scratches the surface. There are a number of things I wanted to address to defend my position that I didn't even get to in the full uncut interview. That's not a criticism of Andrew. I know he has a very generalized audience that would be bored by getting into the weeds of environmentalism and philosophy. It's just difficult for me to summarize a defense of the position in that short of a time frame. I hope that reaching that wider general audience will be the beginning of a conversation. My realistic shorter term goal with doing interviews and this podcast is to generate a conversation about the ethics of procreation. I hope that it can become less taboo to choose to be childless and to question the ethics of it. The LOF interview in this podcast, and hopefully any future interviews, will be part of that. I know such a controversial idea, especially in its infancy, will spark a lot of vitriol and purposeful mischaracterization. That's why the comments on that interview don't surprise me. There were quite a few suggestions that I kill myself. A lot of these people clearly didn't watch the entire video, or else they would have seen that I preemptively addressed that. Unfortunately, the interview didn't get too deep into the terminology, or else I would have made clear from the outset that vehement supports only going extinct through ceasing to procreate, and not through murder or suicide. Though if you just read the title, Voluntary Human Extinction, you might make that assumption, which is what I think most people who made those comments probably did. As I said in the interview, there is a difference between the interests of a being that exists and one that could exist. I support not creating any more persons who would have interests. A being that could exist doesn't have desires, hopes, and fears. I do. I also don't think it is just, it is just to cause my loved ones that pain and suffering resulting in my suicide. I already dedicate my life to restoring habitats on a daily basis at my job, as well as promoting the vehement idea. The people who flippantly tell me to kill myself are simply looking for a way to accuse me of being a hypocrite so that they feel better about not caring about the environment, to feel better about wanting kids. In the uncut interview, I did discuss the terminology a bit more. It would be most accurate, I think, to call myself a biocentric antinatalist. You can hear my current, more in-depth definitions in the first episode of this podcast. If you listened to that episode, however, I have a correction. I called vehement a subset of misanthropic antinatalism. This may not be exactly correct. The difference being that antinatalism begins with the belief that it is unethical to procreate the natural conclusion of which would be extinction if adhered to. While vehement would say that extinction in itself is a good to strive towards, and the most ethical way to achieve that would be to cease procreating. I, re- I agree with both of these arguments, so for now I'll say I'm both a supporter of vehement and a biocentric slash misanthropic antinatalist. A lot of people attack me in the comments for admitting I eat meat. First of all, this is not a refutation of my position. This is a logical fallacy to attack the person delivering the argument instead of the argument itself. I could even have children and it wouldn't invalidate my argument. 
my personal life is irrelevant to the validity of antinatalism or vehement. There is a logical fallacy in there somewhere. Maybe it would qualify as ad hominem, but I'm not entirely sure. It is a fallacy in that it attacks the person delivering the argument instead of the argument itself. This is simply lazy argumentation. You could easily attack anyone who makes an environmental argument for not doing enough, whether it's their diet, or flying in planes, or driving a car, or living in a house with air and heat. Leonardo DiCaprio has been called a hypocrite for being in climate change documentaries while having a private jet that he takes abroad. Like I mentioned in the Loft interview, an OSU study calculated that the impact of having just one child is equivalent to about 2,550 round-trip flights between London and New York. As bad as flying in a private jet might be for someone's carbon footprint, it is difficult to imagine one would reach the equivalent of having just one child. DiCaprio, last I checked, doesn't have any of his own children. So, in spite of living a lavish lifestyle, complete with a private jet, he isn't having as big of an impact as an average American with just one child, never mind someone with two, three, or even more. My point is, we can care about our impact while still having an impact because there is literally no way to exist as a human without negatively impacting the environment, especially as a Westerner. We could all do more, but we will never be good, only less bad. I could criticize vegans as hypocrites for harming wild non-humans and their use of plastics and fossil fuels, for instance, but that doesn't refute the arguments for veganism. Diet is an important contributor to environmental impacts, but it still pales in comparison to reproduction. A study conducted by the World Resources Institute called Shifting Diets for a Sustainable Food Future says, quote, if an additional person eating the average American diet were added to the world population in 2009, the one-time emissions resulting from converting a hectare of land to agriculture to feed that person would be about 300 tons of CO2. End quote. The study also says, quote, the emissions from clearing additional land to feed an additional person eating the U.S. diet are equal to 17 years worth of an average American's energy-related CO2 emissions." End quote. Remember, I quoted in the Loft interview the OSU study, which concluded that having just one child is equivalent to 9,441 metric tons of CO2 emissions. We're talking about 300 tons versus 9,441 tons. Granted, the figure of, of 300 tons is only referring to the footprint of land use conversion for a standard U.S. diet. So, just for argument's sake, let's triple it to 900 tons to account for processing and transporting. That's still nearly a tenth of the cost of having just one child. There's no reason why this has to be an all-or-nothing position when it comes to diet. Either you eat meat or you're a vegetarian slash vegan. That's how most people think. Yet, if your primary concern is the environmental cost, as it is mine, then it would be an enormous improvement just to avoid beef over other meats. This would be called reductionarianism, because it's you still eat meat, but you purposefully reduce the amount of meat that you eat. If you Google the shifting diets for a sustainable food future study, you will find some very useful graphs comparing the land use, fresh water consumption, and CO2 emissions of various types of food. The costs of beef are nearly quadrupled that of the next highest category, which is dairy. Pork, eggs, and poultry are worse than vegetables, but not dramatically so, as beef is. There are many options for someone to reduce the footprint of their diet. They could limit their meat consumption to whenever they eat out at a restaurant, or when a friend makes them a meal, or only to poultry and pork and fish. They could consume fewer calories in general, all of these are improvements. Yes, a person who doesn't eat beef could have even less of an impact by eating vegetarian, and a vegetarian by eating vegan, and a vegan by not eating roots and tubers, and a vegan who doesn't eat roots and tubers by fasting once a week, and they by becoming a fruitarian or breatharian, which are real terms, the former for people who eat only fruits and seeds, and the latter for a person who claims they can exist just fine without eating or drinking at all. 
Again, we could all be doing more, but this doesn't address in any way the ethics of procreation because it remains the single most negative impact we have on the environment. It includes everything from diet to fossil fuels, plastic waste, the spread of invasive species, forest clearing, etc. As for my diet, I avoid beef where I can, opting for chicken or fish. For several years, I only ate meat when I ate out at restaurants and never bought it from the grocery store. I stopped that recently because of some medical issues that might be caused by a soy food allergy. The main reason I haven't opted for meatless alternatives is because many of them are soy based. I also only eat two meals a day on my days off from work. I agree that being vegetarian is better and I might make that transition again. I try to reduce my impact where it is feasible and practical for me in other ways as well. My position is that we all have a negative impact, and it simply isn't realistic to expect anyone born today to not have an impact. I'm not asking people to abandon the trappings of modernity to live off the grid in the woods. It's just not practical for everyone to do that. This is why I called sustainability a pipe dream in the Loft interview. All the things we try to do to lower our footprint are nice and all, but it's still not good. Just less bad. What does less bad mean? It means we continue to harm, just not as much as before. It means we delay the inevitable consequences by a bit. We're still contributing to climate change and species extinctions. We might just delay the shitstorm a bit longer. This is why we shouldn't create new people when we have every reason to expect their lives to have an impact. If you are alive today, you are harming non-human species. It is unavoidable. I do not exempt myself from this. I will be the first to admit these species would be better off had I never been born. But since I am here, the best I can do is end my ancestral line with myself. Some attack me for saying I value the well-being of non-human species while eating meat. This is where the interview fell short. It didn't get in-depth into the reasons I call myself a biocentric antinatalist. If you listen to my first episode, you can hear more of this, but to briefly make a connection here, in that episode, I mentioned two values in biocentrism, those of restitution and non-interference. Non-interference meaning we shouldn't interfere with the ability of wild non-humans to exist and thrive. Yes, some may go extinct naturally, but this is okay, because in those instances, a moral agent, a being capable of moral judgment, isn't causing it whereas a moral agent is causing it when we cause extinctions, which are currently about 1,000 times the natural rate. The value of restitution is to restore the harms we have already caused. So when I said the well-being of non-humans, I was specifically referring to this part of my argument, meaning the ability of wild non-human species to exist free from human interference. None of this is to say I don't agree with the ethical position of veganism. Yes, eating meat contributes to the suffering of domesticated animals, and that is a wrong. For that, you can call me a hypocrite. Yet, again, it has nothing to do with my ethical stance on procreation. So, to those ardent vegans who wish to continue to criticize my current diet, I ask, what is your refutation of the arguments against procreation? I have yet to hear one. If you are passionate about the cause of veganism, there are plenty of channels and podcasts dedicated to that topic. This isn't one of them. Something else I wish I could have addressed in the interview is how the focus of the vehement position is perhaps better framed as it is unethical to have children, and therefore humans would go extinct if we all adhere to this ethic, instead of saying it is ethical for us to go extinct. That's uh, the difference I explained earlier about biocentric nat antinatalism versus vehement. I think both are true, but one certainly feels easier to dismiss outright than the other, um, which is why I've considered adopting the term biocentric antinatalist over voluntary human extinction. As far as I know, the term biocentric antinatal antinatalism is a term I made up by just combining two ex separate existing terms. It's just a way to describe the environmentally focused subset of misanthropic antinatalism. During the full interview, Andrew asked me about some of the common criticisms I've heard. 
this part didn't make it into his final cut. My response was that if people who care about the environment stop having kids, then the people who don't care about the environment will inherit the earth. Basically, this fear is espoused by other environmentalists who tend to be liberal. They fear conservatives becoming more dominant culturally, politically, and ideologically. My response is that children are not carbon copies of their parents. My parents are politically conservative and not nearly as concerned as I am about the environment. Studies have actually shown that as far as nurturing goes and shaping a person, it's less about their parents and more about their social peers. Read The Blank Slate by Steven Pinker for more on that. Our culture has shifted quite a bit over the years. Veganism and vegetarianism actually offer a good analogy here. Not eating meat for ethical reasons has become a cultural norm. It's common for people to ask guests if they eat meat. It's common for work potlucks to offer vegetarian alternatives. It's common, even in the middle of the country, for grocery stores to sell vegan cheeses and alternatives to meat. The number of ethical non-meat eaters has grown quite a bit. Not because existing vegetarians had more children than omnivores, but because the children of omnivores have been exposed to these ideas and adopted them. Similarly, the children of those who don't have an ethical issue with procreation may become exposed to the idea and adopt it for themselves, regardless of their parents' political leanings. Just as everyone, meat eater or otherwise, is at least aware of vegetarianism and the arguments for it, perhaps one day the general public will be aware of ethical non-procreation. If it were simply a matter of liberals and environmentalists having kids to pass these ideas down to, then the logical step would be to not just have kids, but to have as many as possible to gain an upper hand over conservatives. This is the exact opposite of what we should want. The war of ideas is won through conversation, not through procreation. There have been other comments and questions and criticisms, but several can be answered by listening to my first episode or reading my responses in the comments section. I'll close by saying thank you to Andrew Hales for having me on his channel. It was a fun conversation. May we live long and die out.